Wellspring Ministries presents Streams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stover. This dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through the anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and the joys of a fulfilling and abundant Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. As with, uh, we had lunch with uh, Crystal, Don Walker's, one of Don Walker's daughters, and uh, it was just good to, you know, we were reminiscing, talking about him, and of course, she's, she teared up, and which is normal, and uh, just a lot of good memories about a good man, and uh, remember he used to say, God is real. Jesus is alive, and the Holy Ghost still works. <laughs> right? Amen. He said, I'm saved. I'm not trying to be saved. I'm not hoping to be saved. I'm not going to be saved. I am saved. Amen? And uh, he says, if you can believe the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God, you can believe the rest of it. Amen. Uh, huh? Did you? Did you? Really? Yeah. He says, I am who God says I am. I can be what God says I can be. I can have what God says I can have. I'm not weak. I have God's strength. I'm not poor. I have his riches. I'm not sick. I have his health because I'm God's child. God knows it. The devil knows it. And I know it. <laughs> Amen. And, of course, I don't know about you, but I feel good about the whole thing. Yeah. He's a, uh, you know, quite, quite a, quite a guy, quite a guy. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, did you ever get John baptized in the Holy Ghost over at the home group or whatever? Uh, uh, no. Uh, no. Oh, well, why not? <laughs> Better work on that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, all things in due season, right? Oh, my, 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 my. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you about your image and his image. Your image and his image. You know, kids, kids are kids. And... Uh, you know, they, they're out playing and they're having a good old time. You know how it is. You go, you play, you get thirsty, right? Get thirsty. So you come into the house, you get in the fridge, you spot the cookies, you get the cookies down, open up the fridge, you get a glass of milk or something really, you know, good, quench your thirst. And uh, you head back to your room with the cookies and your drink. And, the glass slips, <laughs> and pow, all over the floor, right? It shatters. Mom comes in, and there's an explosion. Why don't you be more careful? What's the matter with you? Don't pay attention. Right? What's it say? Things are more important than me. Things are more important than you are. Then Mom and Johnny, they go to the friend's house, you know, and the chase begins. Kids, they got together, friends, and, you know, the one knows the course, the other one, you're, you're following along, and you're just running, and, and your arm swings, and, of course, the vase gets hit. It's not a vase. This is a vase, you know. This is an expensive vase. And there it goes. Pow! All over the floor, right? And this, again, 
this huge explosion from mom because of course things are more important than me hmm? <coughs> or maybe maybe in the family a poor self-image is fostered by a parent who won't discipline the child uh, how many parents today especially have you heard say I won't discipline my child because I love him so much I, you know I I just love him too much. It hurts me. What they're really saying is this. I'm afraid I'll lose the love of this child if I, in fact, do discipline him, and therefore I'm not going to do it. And that's covert rejection. You know, you're not just coming out and out and rejecting, but you're, you are covertly rejecting them because it violates every principle that our Lord handed down regarding child rearing. Parents are supposed to be parents. And they're expected to lead, to guide, teach, instruct, and discipline. And if we love our children, we will discipline them. I mean, after all, even God chastises those he loves. You know, we're not talking abuse here. We're not talking about beatings. But uh, it may, depending on the personality of the child, it may, uh, it, you might have to get a switch out. <laughs> you know, it's nice if you can just talk to them, but they don't all talk to Amen. But it's important because we need to know. We know there's rules. We always we know there's rules. We just like to know what they are, uh, so that we can, some yeah, sometimes push the limits. Just see if they're really the rules, and we need to know that the rules are, the rules. Amen. Amen. Or you know you have. Maybe mom says, you dummy, you can't do anything right. Uh, I, I used to get a lot of that from, you know, never amount to anything. You're just like your father, you know, well, whatever. <laughs> Not good stuff. Anyway, a lot of sources that, that like this, that, that just, they corrupt our image. They corrupt our self-image. Now, now think about this. Somebody, we, we have some friends that they, they have, very expensive horses, and so a hundred and fifty thousand dollar horse is a pretty quality horse. You know, most of them are fifty grand and up horses. Uh, so, I've got this hundred and fifty thousand dollar horse, and I say to you, "Hey, I want you. I'm, I want to go on a vacation. I want to take a vacation. I'll pay you really, really well if you will take care of my horse. Take care of my horse while I'm gone. I'll be gone six months. Nice vacation, right?" I'll be gone six months. I'd like you to take care of my horse. I'll really make it worth your while. And I'll give you his eating schedule, his workout schedule, everything you need to know to take care of the horse. I'll give you all the information, and you can, you know, uh, take care of the horse. And so, I mean, you're going to take good care of that horse, aren't you? This is a $150,000 horse, man, and these people are really going to pay you well. You're going to take good care of that horse. And uh, the problem is that most of us would take better care of the horse then we'll take care of ourselves when you think about it. You wouldn't keep him up until all hours of the night and pour coffee and soda and ice cream, ice cream and, well, nobody here, but booze down this horse's throat. You wouldn't stuff him with potato chips and dip and all kinds of junk food, would you? No, 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 no. You'd make sure he got the proper amount of rest exercise and good food, right? Come on. Huh? You'd take better care of him than you would of you. Oh, huh? you need to fall in love with you. Amen. Otherwise, how are you going to love your neighbor as you love yourself? Think about it. Hmm? Think about it. Now, I understand. There, there's, a, there's a secular side of this that that says, I'm okay, you're okay, and, you know, whatever I want to do, I can do, and yeah, 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 and that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about that every human being was created in the image and the likeness of God, and because of that has great, great intrinsic value. 
And we need to begin to look at ourselves that way. And especially now, if you're born again, come on. God paid the ultimate price for you. He loved you so much, he gave his son. And, uh, you know, so it, it's important that the images that you have of yourself today be in, well, how God sees you. Not what your experience has taught you about you. Right? The experiences of the past have not made you the way you are, but they have made you believe you are the way you are. Hmm? The image you have of yourself is how you wound up being the way you are today. Be that as it may. Huh? So maybe you're satisfied with yourself, but if you're not, then maybe some of what uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try to share today will help you to understand why you are the way you are and how to begin to change into what you really want to be. In reality, you can do anything you want to if you believe you can. You can. In Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So there's a biblical principle here that I'm talking about, and, and there, there's much to be said for getting our thinking straight. If you cannot believe, there's really nothing possible to those who can't believe. If anything is possible to those who do believe, then nothing is impossible to those who cannot believe. But we can do anything that we really set our mind to. But there's this image problem that many times will stop us, you know. How many times have you heard people say, I can't quit smoking? I'm, I was one of those. Well, I can't quit. I've tried. I can't quit. You know, thank God the Lord intervened and he made a can't a can. I can't lose weight on a diet. Hmm. Eggs make me sick. I'm always late, just the way I am. Man, I'm always a day late and a dollar short. You know, I, I don't know what it is. It's just, everything I touch falls apart. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. If you want a program ruined, just give it to me. Huh? Nobody here thinks like that, I'm sure. But anyway. it, it's images, images about ourselves that have been imprinted by experience and various things. And yet Mark 7, chapter 7, verse 20 through 23 says simply that that which comes out of your mouth is what defiles you. That which comes out of your mouth is that which defiles you. But here's the good news. You can start at any given moment. You can start right now to change the image of yourself. You, do, you don't have to be locked into where you are. You can change. Jesus actually came to change our minds. That's what repentance means. We, we turn and we agree with God. We change our mind of, about how we think and we begin to agree with God. Well, what does God say about us? See, we can always change for the better. Firstly, six steps here. Firstly, realize Jesus destroyed Satan's power over you. That's so important. First John uh, 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 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He destroyed Satan's power over you. Secondly, realize Jesus went to the cross and became a curse so that you, so that the sins of your fathers need not be visited upon you. Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Exodus 20 and 5. Jesus became a curse. We were cursed because of the fall. And because of the fall, then the environment that we 
are born into and we grow up in is corrupted and we get this damaged image of who we really are. But once you're born again and you become a child of God, all of a sudden the curse is broken and you become the blessed. Hallelujah. And the power of sin and the power of Satan has been stripped off of you and you don't have to labor under that anymore. Jesus went to the cross for you personally. If there was nobody else on earth, no one else, just you, God still would have sent his son Jesus to redeem you. That's how important you are. And we've got to get that into our heads. See? And we realize that the image, thirdly, we have to realize the image we have today was made in error. It's a false concept. Remember, Johnny felt less important than the glass of milk or the vase, right? But the real fact was and is that he's always more important than things. We all are more important than things. We always seem to jump to, oh my gosh, this and you, you broke that. Like, you know, it's, well, you have a, an, a, you get in an accident and say, well, how's the car? No, no, who cares about, how's the car? How are you? Because you're more important. More important than anything then realize if the image you have of yourself is based on error, then it can be changed. Errors can always be corrected. And of course, the blood of Jesus is the great error eraser. Praise God. He, it just washes away, right? Just washes away every stain of sin and every error or erroneous uh, kind of thinking. Number five, decide who it is you want to be. Hmm. See, you know, I, I remember as a kid, I wanted to be a policeman. Then I wanted to be a soldier. Then I wanted to be a fireman. Then I wanted to be a policeman. You know, <laughs> and uh, now here I am, I'm a pastor. And I actually did apply for the, the Las Vegas Metro, though, as I was wrestling about what, what to do with my life uh, at a certain point. And I realized... I just withdrew the application because I realized I was called into the ministry and that's what I was going to do. So, Thank you, Jesus. Huh? Number five? It, it, decide what you want to be. Decide who you want to be and what you want to be. What you want to be like. Shakespeare said, assume a virtue and you'll have it. Assume a virtue and you'll have it. See a virtue in someone you respect, respect and assume it. In other words, it's the idea that bad, bad company corrupts good morals or good character. And we, when we're born again, we need to get around those that believe like us, right. that will encourage us, that, 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 ex, that, that want the best for us, hmm? yeah. and, and will kind of cheer us on when, when things are kind of tough. Amen. Amen. And, so, and, and there are some people that you... You just run into them, and I, I mean, Donald Walker was one of those kind of guys. I like to be around him because I, I'd like to, I'd like to have some of his characteristics in my life. You know, he was solid in his faith, even through thick or thin, and just never, never wavered. That's phenomenal. You don't see a lot of that. A lot of people are good time Christians, or they're they're big on faith until things get tough, and then they fall apart. And not that we all don't struggle in the rough times, but the thing is that there, some can, having done all stand and uh, uh, others don't, uh, but he did. Uh, I think I've only known two people, him and one other, that was uh, just so positive all the time, just so sh sure, assured that God had everything in control. Praise the Lord. That's really something. So we decide who we want to be. And uh, why, why not look at Jesus? I mean, that's, that's a great model, right? Take a look at the Lord. And, and uh, you say, well, I, how do I do that? Well, read the Bible. That's what it, that's, the Bible is a picture of Jesus, really. And, and just look at Jesus and then assume his attributes. Why not become like him? Why not? Why not? What did he do? Well, he went about doing good and healing all of those oppressed of the devil. That sounds good to me. Why don't I do that? Just go about doing good. 
<laughs> Amen? And healing all those oppressed of the devil. That's a good thing, right? I mean, he cleansed the lepers, he healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead. Well, okay, then why don't I do the same thing? That sounds pretty simple. I mean, I realize that I can't do any of that. It has to be him working in and through me, but that's the, that is the deal, isn't it? Christ in us, the hope of glory. We can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. Glory. So we assume his attributes. And why not? Become like him. I mean, what what a what an awesome goal. Huh? Especially when it's promised by God that he will make us conformable to the image of Christ. So so all we're doing is that here again, we're repenting or agreeing with God, getting rid of any other concepts we have, and say, well, if God's going to make me like Jesus, I might as well start cooperating. Move along with it. huh? And uh, not get all bummed out if I don't quite make it one day or the next, but just that's the goal, and that's where we're going. Amen. Because that's who God wants us to be like anyhow, and, and that's pretty exciting, I think. You know, that God wants us to be like Jesus. It's great. So let's look at Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And uh, the same was in the beginning with God. Praise the Lord. This, so, so Jesus is God. Amen. As much as the Father is God or the Holy Spirit is God. And He was always there. He was in the beginning. He wasn't a first created angel, or any of those kinds of things. Then in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it tells us that Jesus is the express image of the invisible God. So if we can see Jesus, we can see God. In fact, he asked one of his, he, he told one of his disciples once, he says, if, if you know, it, you know, he said, show, show us the Father. He says, if if, you, if you've been seen me, you've seen the Father. Hmm? John chapter 1, verse 3 says, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'd like to become a person full of grace and truth, wouldn't you? Huh? Hallelujah. Matthew 4.23, Matthew 9.35, he was teaching and preaching and healing disease. Can we do that? Yes. Absolutely. Because he has anointed us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Amen? If If that's true of Jesus, is true of us because Jesus is in our hearts, in our lives. We're commingled together with God in our spirit and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus would go and he'd pray even when he had to make time to do it. Well, you know what? That's a good, that's a good life change right there. That's a good goal. That's a good thing to, to begin to do, right? If we've not been doing it, just make time. Say, I don't have any time. Fine, make time. We make time for everything else that we want to do. Like, uh, who was it, Dr. Uh, Don Arnold? He said after 45 years of ministry, he learned one thing. People do what people want to do. Pretty simple. So we, we will do what we really want to do, right? So we can make time and uh, be, be like Jesus in that sense. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 17. And Mark chapter 1, verse 41. said so Jesus was compassionate and was touched by the infirmities of man. Well, there's an attribute I'd like to have, to be compassionate. Hmm? And to be touched with the infirmities of others. Right? It, I guess then I'd have to quit being selfish, wouldn't I? Right? Yeah. Hallelujah. So many things we can say, well, you know, this is, there's so much in Jesus I, that's just awesome. I want to be like that. Well, why not? Huh? If we can change, and we can, especially with the, 
with the enablement of the Holy Spirit who has come to form us in that image from glory to glory. He's changing us. The likeness of, of, and, of, Im, of, of an image of Jesus. Praise God. It's a process, but we can move that way. We can press into those kinds of things. And, and where we fall, up, fall short, we can just, you know, ask for forgiveness and stay on course. Hmm. Matthew 28, 18 and Mark uh, 1, 22. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And when he spoke, uh, his authority was evident and he astonished all who heard him. And then he, he turns around and he tells us to do the same thing. Uh, in, uh, uh, did whatsoever things you'll say, right? if you believe, you'll have them. To speak, that you can speak to a mountain, it has to move. You can speak to a fig tree, it'll wither up by the roots. I mean, if you walk in the authority of God, uh, not just randomly going around saying silly things to test God, but to, to be it, 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 in that relationship with the Father to where you can hear him tell you what to say, and you just say it, and it, it'll, come, it'll work, won't it? Hmm? That's what the Bible says. And we astonish them, all that hear us. I mean, it's pretty amazing, really, what, what, how God will speak through us and, and what impact and effect that will have. Ephesians 5.29 and 1 Timothy 2.6, Jesus gave himself for the benefit of whosoever will. I think that that's something I struggle with. I, you know, to allow the whosoever wants to stop you from being available to the whosoever wills is a great danger. You know, you, you, you want everybody to hear the message, right? To respond to the gospel. You want everybody, as a preacher, I want everybody to, to take what I teach and make it a part of their lives because I try to keep it, make it the word of God, you know, and make it good for them, right? And when they don't, well, if enough of them don't, it's easy to get discouraged. And yet, you know what? That's not our responsibility. We come to the whosoever wills. And thank God it, when we find some. Amen? Amen? Jesus gave himself for the benefit of the whosoever wills, not the whosoever will not. Not that he wasn't available to them. Not that he wasn't willing. Not that he didn't the same sacrifice was given for all, but it was only appropriated by the whosoever wills. Now let's look at you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, We have put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We put on the new man, renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So God is working in us and, and transforming us and changing us. And he just, he started out by making us brand new. Old things passed away. All things became new. Our spirit's not a rework. It's just new. Praise the Lord. In, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we're told that when we look upon Jesus, we're changed into the same image by the Spirit of God. Okay. You read your Bible, it's like looking in a mirror, and what you see is Jesus. And you are transformed by looking therein. In Philippians 3.21, it says that even our body will be made to be like his body. Well, what's his body right now? Transfigured. He's flesh and bone. Not flesh and blood, flesh and bone. He's a, he's a, a transfigured man. He's a, a totally different kind of a being. And we're going to be like him. This mortal shall put on 
immortality, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. And uh, in Romans 8, 29, we're told to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And even as far back as Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and Genesis 9, 6, we can see that we are made after the image and likeness of God. We, it's not from goo to you by way of the zoo. We didn't crawl out of a primordial... Uh, <laughs> bubble of mud, you know. We were created in the image and likeness of God. And then spend time with the person you want to be like. That's probably the most important. You want to be like Jesus, spend time with him. You're going to become like who you hang around with. So spend time with him in prayer. Hang out with him. And, and you'll become more and more like him. You, you can be anything you want to be. You can be the kind of person you want to be. You, you already have the God-given talents, the God-given uh, gifts, the God-given abilities, the manifold grace of God to be who you want to be. Remember, uh, this, what is it in the Psalms? It says God gives us the desire of our heart. He actually places within us these desires to be more than who, what we are, to, be, to go beyond uh, where we find ourselves, to become more and more like him. And he's put everything in us that, that we need to do that. And so we need to get a proper view of who we are as a child of the Most High God, and then nothing at all will be limiting to you. It, it, it is important to have a right self-image. Not, not an overstated, egotistical uh, idea of who you are out, without God. But when you're in Christ, you, you, can, you can actually expect to become like him. That's the goal. And so what if it doesn't happen in this li lifetime? If you're progressing, if you're moving that way, because when you, when you wind up in heaven, you're going to be like him, just like him. That's a promise. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we get a, a proper view of who we are. I'm a child of God. I'm not just a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Jesus called, no longer called me a servant, but he called me a friend. But he also brought me into the family, and he's my elder brother. Praise God. Nothing is limiting uh, to us. In, in uh, Mark uh, chapter 11, verse 22 and 24. Uh, let me read it. Okay, that's the... Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God, or as some translations say, have the faith of God constantly. Truly, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up, thrown into the sea, does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust and be confident that it's granted to you and you will get it. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. See, there's not, there's, there is not another person like you. As we've, we've understood that, as we find out we, we all have different fingerprints, we all have different uh, iris readings in our eyes, we all, uh, our hair is different, our DNA... I mean, everything is just so unique and so different. And, and it's not something that we should laugh off with a, just a shrug and it's like, well, okay, whatever. We need to, to pause and think and, and soak in the impact of being uniquely 
a child of God. You are unique. You are special. You are one of a kind. And that means that only you can fill your place, your particular place, not only in the world, but in the body of Christ. Nobody else can fill your slot, can replace you. You have talents, great or small. They're priceless when they're used to their fullest. You, you have intelligence and ability to make your own decisions. You have the mind of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 2.16. And a few moments of sincere thought should convince you that in Christ, you're quite a person. You really are. It doesn't matter if anybody else recognizes you or not. A lot of times, jealousy will blind people or those kinds of things. But you can be considerate. You can be kind. You can be compassionate. Or you can be the proverbial pain in the neck. You can look for and perform your share of the work of the ministry and the, and the world's work. Or you can just sit back in an easy chair and ask the church and ask the world to just gr grant you a living at everybody else's expense and all the benefits at everybody else's expense. You can grumble and gripe. You never had a chance. Or you can go do your job better than it was done yesterday and create your own opportunities and show God that you are a good steward of the things that he has entrusted you with. You can keep your spirit, your mind, your body healthy and clean or you can drink yourself into oblivion and, and uh, uh, you know hope somebody else will come along and fish you out. You can you can read the scriptures and good literature and improve your spiritual condition and improve your mind and, and, and take in the thoughts of God and of the best minds in the world. Or you can pick up some trash novel or, or, or uh, you know, some philosophical uh, uh, book or, or magazines that belong in the trash can. And, and pollute your minds and not develop it. You can devour your energies in accumulating cash uh, for your heirs to fight over, or you can learn the joy of sharing and find abundance beyond your fondest dreams. Because you can't outgive God. It, it, it's a race he loves to run. There's an immutable law of our universe that says you will receive what you've given away and that that the only treasure you will really keep in heaven is the thing that you have laid up in store there. You're the most important person that you'll ever chance to meet. Uh, I liked it when Dr. John would talk about looking himself in the mirror and, and speaking well of himself. That's not a bad thing. As long as you understand, God, you have made something that is very unique and very wonderful and very special. And, and because of that, you, you must accept the responsibilities that are inherent in your greatness. It's one thing to say, well, I'm great, you know, but you've got to have the responsibility that goes with it and act upon it. Use what God has put within you. Let him, let him take you to the fullness of all that he's provided you with. And... and You've got to leave this world and this, this, this visible kingdom of God, this church being just a little bit better, a little bit worse for your living. It's just going to work out that way. How much better to have run the race and finished the course and hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Whatever I've put it, invested in you, you have made increase of. You've done well with. Praise the Lord. There's only one you. So check your image of yourself and uh, be all that God has called you to be, all that you are meant to be. Praise the Lord. I hope that helps you tonight. Praise the Lord. Pastor, what was number six? Mephiris decides he wants to be realized. Yeah, I don't think I said number six, so it would have gone. Spend time with the person you want to be like.
And Lord, we are, we are here together with you. And we do, we want to be like you. And in our private times, our alone times with you, we cherish them. We thank you for them. And we thank you, Lord, that we can boast in you. The devil would like to convince us that we're nothing, uh, nobody going nowhere. But you, Lord, have given us great and precious promises, invested in us with those things that we can share with others, share with the world, to make it a better place, to encourage others to, to excel. Lord, help us by your Spirit to be all that you, Jesus, went to the cross to provide us an opportunity for. We can truly do all things through you, which strengtheneth us. And we thank you that uh, you've given us the ability to persist, persist so that we will then prevail and you'll get all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.